Recording in progress. We are live and on air. Thank you. For the meeting of the New York City Council, please come to order. Would you all please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Let the record show that all members of the City Council are here this evening, with the exception of uh, Council Member Freitas. And for those that are participating via Zoom, when you get to the item that you want to speak on, please use the raise your hand feature and the City Clerk will turn on your microphone to speak at the appropriate time. Let's see, the first item of business is introduction of new employees. Will uh, Becca Hicks and Alicia Reyes please join me? at the podium up there. Well, ladies, welcome to Newark. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the two newest employees for the city of Newark, and I'd like to start off with introducing Alicia Reyes, and she joined the city uh, public works engineering division. <laughs> In May, as a junior civil, civil engineer. Alicia graduated from San Jose State University with a Bachelor of Science in civil engineering and has previously worked for the city of San Jose and most recently the city of San Rafael. She has hit the ground running providing much needed support for both our private development and capital improvement program groups. In her spare time, Alicia enjoys traveling both locally and abroad with her favorite destination so far being Barcelona. She presently lives in San Ramon. San Ramon is quite a commute but is currently looking to move to the Tri-City area and is excited for the opportunity to further her career as an engineer while serving the residents of Newark. So Alicia, I want to congratulate you and welcome you to the city. Thank you, thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, this is Becca Hicks. She was appointed to the Recreation Coordinator position at the Newark Senior Center in May. Becca joins the Newark Recreation and Community Services Department in 2018 at the Silliman Center and as a part-time recreation leader in teen and special events. In the four years that she has worked with the city, she has held numerous positions, including that of preschool instructor and office assistant. In 2020, Becca graduated from San Jose State University with her bachelor's degree in design studies with an emphasis in graphic design. After graduating, she was able to devote more time to the recreation department as it continuously adapted and found creative ways to engage the community during the closure. Becca is a lifelong Newark resident who enjoys being outdoors, going for hikes, watching football, go Niners, and creating designs for friends and family. Most importantly, Becca is looking forward to continuing and growing her career with the city of Newark. And Becca, I want to welcome you to the, into the city again. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, you two may sit down now. Yeah, they follow instructions very well. Okay, the next presentation is for the Portuguese Fraternal Society of America, Council Number 16, Holy Ghost Festival. And I'd like to ask that uh, Roger Perea, the Marshal, Diane Perea, and Paul Mendez please join me up here. Hello, this is really a busy time for y'all, isn't it? How are you, sir? Hi, how are you? Hello, how are you? So ladies and gentlemen, this is proclamation number 1875, Portuguese Fraternal Society of America, council number 16, 99th anniversary. Wow. 
or as the annual Newark Pavilion Portuguese Fraternal Society of America, PFSA, Council Number 16, Holy Ghost Festival will be celebrated in Newark on July 23rd and 24th of 2022. And whereas this event will also be the celebration of the society's 99th anniversary in the city of Newark, and whereas the early members of PFSA were involved in and contributed greatly to the development of the city of Newark, and whereas these early members of PFSA established the Holy Ghost Festival, thus preserving their Portuguese homeland traditions and sharing those traditions with all Newark residents, and whereas the city of Newark wishes to join the Portuguese community of Newark in the celebration of their 99th anniversary of the annual Newark Pavilion PFSA Council Number 16 Holy Ghost Festival. Now, therefore, I, Alan L. Nagy, Mayor of the City of Newark, on behalf of the Newark City Council, do hereby proclaim July 23rd and 24th of 2022 as days of celebration of the Portuguese Paternal Society of America Council Number 16, 99th anniversary and ask all citizens of Newark to join in celebration of this event in celebration of the rich cultural history that our Portuguese community shares with all residents of Newark. And I'd like to present that to you, and do you have anything to say? I want to say thank you to all here. I want to say thank you, and uh, I wish you guys would be there on the 23rd and 24th too. Celebrate with us. You guys can enjoy some sopas. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, and then finally, I have uh, one unscheduled presentation to make. And uh, let me say that uh, this community doesn't move forward unless this person is here uh, helping to do that because uh, uh, he has a lot of responsibilities. And for 25 years, he's been uh, the person that's... Uh... <laughs> oh, you get an idea that I might be talking about Soren. Soren, would you come up here, please? <laughs> <laughs> Are you paying for that? <laughs> I think you said lunch tomorrow's on Soren. Okay, so Soren, this is commendation, uh, commending Soren Peugeot for 25 years of service. Whereas Soren Peugeot began his career with the city of Newark on May 19, 1997, as an engineering tech one in an engineering division of the Public Works Department. And whereas Soren Peugeot has been steadily promoted throughout his career, and in 2001, he was promoted to assistant engineer, civil, in 2004, to associate civil engineer, in 2007, to senior civil engineer, and in 2014, he was reclassified to assistant city engineer, and then in 2016, he was promoted to public works director. And whereas Soren Peugeot has been the project manager, for numerous public works projects, including the city entrance feature at Thornton Avenue and Cedar Boulevard, the Lakeshore Park seawall replacement, citywide handicap ramps, the geographic information systems and streetscape, paving, backup sound walls, and landscaping projects. You must be pretty tired doing all that stuff. <laughs> and whereas Soren Peugeot led the completion of the city's first pedestrian and bicycle master plan, performed the engineering review of many of the city's commercial and residential developments, and continues to oversee and coordinate the preparation of the biennial capital improvement plan. And whereas Soren Peugeot was nominated for Employee of the Year in 2006, 2007, and 2011, he received a Pride Award in 1999 for the extra work he put in on the Park Play Apparatus Rehabilitation Project and received an incentive award in 2022 for his assistance with the Newark Civic Center grand opening. And whereas Soren Feijot represents the city on regional committees, such as the Congestion Management uh, Program, Alameda County Transportation Commission, Southern Alameda County Geographic Information System Authority, and Countywide Clean Water Program. And whereas Soren Feijot is celebrating 25 years of dedicated service to the city of Newark. Now, therefore, I, Alan L. Nagy, Mayor of the City of Newark, on behalf of the Newark City Council, do we hereby commend 
Soren Peugeot for his untiring work and professionalism and congratulate him on completing 25 years of service. So Soren, let me present that to you. There you go. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Soren Peugeot. Okay, the next item on our agenda is public comment on any item not listed on tonight's agenda. For Zoom attendees, please use the raise your hand feature if you'd like to speak. First of all, would anybody in the audience like to speak this evening? Nobody? Okay. Then City Clerk Harrington, is there anybody on Zoom? No, Your Honor. Okay. Then the next item on the agenda is the consent calendar. The consent calendar this evening consists of items D1 through D3. Uh, first, is there any item that staff would like pulled from the consent calendar? Not this evening, Your Honor. Okay. Are there any items that the public would like pulled from the consent calendar? D1 through D3. Nope. Okay. Are there any items that the council would like pulled from the consent calendar? Okay. And uh, nobody on Zoom? Nobody okay. on Zoom, sir. Okay. So the consent calendar is going to consist of the following items. Item D1 is approval of audit demands. Item D2 is approval of the June 23rd, 2022 special and regular meeting minutes. And item D3 is adopt the resolutions, finding that there is a proclaimed state of emergency, finding that the meeting in person would present imminent risk to the health or safety of attendees as a result of the state of emergency, and authorizing the continued remote teleconference meetings of the legislative bodies of the city of Newark for the 30-day period beginning July 14th, pursuant to AB 361. Would someone like to move that the items be approved as recommended by staff with any items approved by resolution or ordinance being numbered consecutively and that the reading of the title suffice for the purposes of introduction or adoption of the ordinance? So moved. Okay, okay. Moved by Council Member Bucci, seconded by Vice Mayor Hannon. Okay, please vote. Okay, motion passes, four ayes and one absent. Council member Freitas is absent. Okay, the public hearing staff report, please, Mr. Burnett. Yes, good evening, Your Honor, members of the council. Item E1 is a hearing to consider property owners' objections and adopt a resolution confirming the superintendent of streets report concerning weed abatement assessments. If the council may recall back on May 26th, the council directed the superintendent of streets to abate weeds on 125 parcels of lands situated in the city of Newark. Following the notification, property owners cleared 113 parcels, and the remaining 12 parcels were cleared by the city's contractor. Staff recommends assessments ranging the amounts of $540 per parcel to $4,536 per parcel. This includes the actual contractor costs as well as 20% administrative costs. The combined, combined total assessments are $15,876. Staff recommends that the council open the public hearing, receive and act upon any objections by property owners, close the public hearing, and adopt the resolution confirming the report. We'd be happy to answer any questions that the council may have. Okay, is there any question of council? Okay, if not, the public hearing to consider property owners' objections and adopt the resolution confirming the superintendent of streets report concerning weed abatement assessments is now open. Would anybody in the audience like to speak on this item? Anybody? Nope. Okay, uh, Ms. Harrington, any requests uh, to speak from Zoom? No, Your Honor. Okay, and then the public hearing is now closed. Uh, does the City Council have any comments? A uh, quick one. Yes, Council Member Bucci. Yeah, come on. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Menoon, I'm just curious how many of those properties belong to the railroad? The attack.
attachment we provided the staff report identifies the parcel number, um, APN, um, and location. We don't identify the owner, but based off my cursory review, it does look like at least um, at least two appear to be uh, railroad property, potentially more. Okay, how many total? On 13. Okay, well, it's getting better. Thank you. Yes, um, Vice Mayor Hannon. Yes, uh, thank you to Councilmember Bucci's uh, question. Would it be possible in the future for Exhibit A to include the property owner information so we know whether or not uh, some of these, w what number of these are railroad property, et cetera? Would that be possible for staff to be able to incorporate? Sure, I'd be happy to review that. Uh, assuming there's no legal objections, we'd be happy to incorporate that. And then secondly, and I think I may have asked this before, I just want to make sure that we're recovering all of our administrative costs to uh, implement this program. And I know we charge a 20% administrative fee. I'm not asking for that information tonight, but when this comes back to us next year, if staff could, again, look at that calculation to make sure that we're receiving um, a fee that is supportive of uh, reimbursing us for our costs. Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Okay, if not, would somebody like to make a motion again? Move to approve. Okay. Second. Okay, moved by uh, Council Member Bushi, seconded by Vice Mayor Hannon. Uh, please vote. Motion passes, four ayes. Uh, one recused, Council Member Freitas. Resolution of the City Council of the City of Newark confirming the report of the Superintendent of Streets concerning weed abatement. Okay. So the next item is other business and uh, staff report, please, Mr. Bernoon. Yes, good evening, Your Honor, members of the Council. Item F1 is a presentation from City staff and consultants um, regarding quiet zone study. Uh, tonight we have Mr. Jason Umai, who has been the staff point person uh, in regards to this matter. I'll give a brief introduction and pass it over to the consultant that the city retained on this. Uh, the consultant will provide an overview of uh, his findings relating to crafts at grade crossings within the city of Newark, uh, recommendation for quiet zone improvements, estimated cost of those improvements, as well as a review of available funding sources. So before we pass it over to the consultant, pass it over to Assistant City Engineer, Mr. Jason Amai. Mr. Amai. Uh, thank you, City Manager Boone. Um, good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council. The public works Division is pleased to present to you this evening the results of Newark's Railroad Quiet Zone Feasibility Study. The study was performed by the city's consultant, R.L. Banks & Associates, a national transportation consulting firm providing services focused exclusively on railroads for the past 65 years. Tonight, we have the pleasure of having with us at the podium Mr. Thomas Messer, who is a nationally recognized expert in the field of freight and passenger rail planning and analysis having served as technical advisor to both the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials and the National Cooperative Highway Research Program, more commonly referred to as AASHTO and NCHRP, respectively. Also with us tonight via Zoom from New Jersey is Mr. Michael Allen, who has over 25 years of experience in advising clients on regulatory compliance issues surrounding at-grade railroad crossings. So gentlemen, um, I'll now turn the presentation over to you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of City Council. It's a pleasure to be here in the city of Newark, and I commend you for your efforts to establish a quiet zone for your city. Um, there are many cities across the country that are looking into this issue, and they're finding that the benefits far outweigh the cost. I want to go over with you a little bit about what we have done uh, for this study. The first thing we did is we um, we took a, a look at the Federal Railroad Administration's Great Crossing Inventory for the City of Newark. An, an annotated version of, of that is up in front of you. Um, and here is a map that shows the three quiet zone areas that we determined were most feasible to be funded. The first zone is a north-south corridor called the Coast Subdivision. It essentially parallels Interstate I-80. Um, the second corridor is the uh, east-west corridor um, approximately between Thornton Avenue and Peralta Boulevard. 
And then the third corridor is the um, Newark Industrial Lead. So I'll go through each one of those individually and explain to you um, what we discovered. The, there were actually four possible quiet zones. Three were recommended. The coast subdivision between Jarvis Avenue and Central Avenue. Maori Avenue, which is we determined is a separate zone because it's more than a mile away from the other crossings. And the Nile subdivision between Sycamore Street and Cedar Boulevard. The one not recommended was the Newark Industrial Lead between Ash Street and Willow Road. And we excluded five private crossings that we deemed were not relevant to this study. The recommended improvements for the Coast Sub were that Jarvis a Avenue does not require any improvements in order to meet the standards for a quiet zone. Haley Street the, would, would require the construction of four quadrant gates and collapsible bollards. Mayhew's Landing Road, four quadrant gates and collapsible bollards. Thornton Avenue would also require four quadrant gates, candelivered signals, collapsible bollards, and an additional crossing signal with a do not block the fire station sign west of the fire station because there, the fire station is, could be a problem if it's blocked during an emergency. Carter Avenue requires double gates each side and to extend the median on the northbound side further south to prevent traffic from going around the, uh, the gates. And then Central Avenue crossing, we understand that's a proposal to be grade separated. So the quiet zone risk index, if all of these recommended improvements were implemented, would be 1,691 as compared to the current risk index of 51,907. Recommended improvements for Maui Avenue quiet zone. The Maui Avenue plans submitted by the development meet the criteria for quiet zone, but my, un my understanding is, is that this development is still up in the air, so we're not sure um, if that's gonna go forward or not. But, but the risk um, without the improvements is 36,000 compared to uh, a, a much lower risk of only 5,000 if we implemented a quiet zone uh, project there. Recommended improvements for the Nile subdivision. Cedar Boulevard would require four quadrant gates and collapsible bollards. Cherry Street, there is no crossing improvement needed. The intersection with Blaine Avenue on the west side needs to be reconfigured to meet the 60 foot separation requirement and may need a waiver. Sycamore Street, four quadrant gates along with additional center striping and collapsible bollards. Once these recommended improvements are implemented, the quiet zone risk drops from 47,000 down to 6,000. The Newark Industrial Lead quiet zone, we don't recommend doing any improvements in that zone. The reason being is there's no active railroad activity in that area. Um, but we did notice that there is an issue with uh, the current signals that are down there that we recommend removing those signals and placing a passive crossing signal there. That way there people don't have the, the uh, may, may get a wrong feeling about whether or not it's safe to cross a crossing down there. And then there was, um, Private, private crossings that we include, excluded from the study on the coast subdivision at milepost 29.58, there's a gated private access road to access the drainage, and we didn't feel like it would be necessary to do any kind of special uh, safety 
equipment at that crossing because of the very infrequent use that it, it's, it sees. Also, uh, milepost 31.29 on the coast sub is another private crossing, but it's within the yard limits. The speed limit of the trains in that area is 10 miles an hour, and we didn't think that there, was, there would be a need to do any kind of um, safety improvements. Also, um, milepost 33.4 on the coast subdivision, the Stevenson Boulevard pri private crossing at the Fremont city line. And that completes my presentation. Okay. Um, I have a few questions for you. And uh, one is when you did your study, was there any consideration to the Capitol Corridor and the possibility of uh, that using the coastal route instead of the current uh, configuration where it goes into Fremont? Yes, we're, we're aware of that possibility, and we did take that into consideration. Um, the reality is, is that the trains, the, the passenger trains will move over to the coast, and the freight trains will move over to the Niles, so it'll be, there'll be, uh, there'll still be a lot of trains, and we based our analysis on the existing, what's going on right now, but, but that can easily be changed if a plan is, is put into place for the Capitol Quarter trains to use the coast. I know they've been talking about that for a few years now, and uh, right. <laughs> so they still haven't got, got the money to do it yet. Okay. Well, let's hope they never get the money to do it. Uh, can, can you explain to us what a collapsible ballard, a bollard is? Class, collapsible bollards, you'll probably see them in construction sites. They're the orange uh, staffs that they glue onto the surface of the road, and they're, they're flexible, like you can drive over them, but they basically use to guide traffic so you don't want traffic to go at a certain location but they're not an impenetrable barrier. You can still drive over them. Okay. But it's just basically to guide the traffic around to where you want the traffic to be rather than them not being sure which way to go. Right, okay. It's kind of a passive restraint. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Vice Mayor Hannon. Yes, Mayor, thank you. I have a number of questions. Um, along the same line as the Mayor, what is it, four quadrant gates Four quadrant gates, well, you're probably familiar with the two, right. the two gates. So four quadrant gates means, like let's say you have a roadway with a median separation. So the four quadrant gates, you'd have this, let's say this is the northbound side, that would be closed. Okay. Also the southbound <clears throat> side would be closed. Okay. So it's basically a, perma it's, a, it's a closure of the entire roadway for the trains. You have to have that safety factor if the, if the trains aren't gonna blow the horn to go through the crossing. Perfect. And it, it, it works very well. We, we have a lot of them down in Southern California and um, <clears throat> they're very, very good at, you know, the preventing cars from going around the gates and causing a problem. Exactly, thank you. And um, the reduction in the uh, Maori area in terms of the uh, scoring, was that based on the possibility of development or would that that was simply based on as I think as you mentioned the current configuration as it is today um, I don't know I have to ask Mike Allen that question I'm okay. not Mike, Mike is on okay uh, stand by for life yes okay that was based on the developers plan versus what is in there now okay so with that understanding I would imagine if no development were to proceed in that area, uh, the score would probably stu still be relatively low because there would be very minimal impact. Would that be a correct statement? If there's no development in the area, then the developer would not be spending the money on the changes to the crossing. So the crossing would stay as it is and the risk, risk index would remain high. Were the the federal funding that is out there and use that to upgrade the crossing then the, on their own, then the uh, index would drop to what we have there as the uh, future one. Thank you. 
you mentioned the um, Newark industrial area, and I think you, a number of those lines are currently used, if I understood you correctly. That is correct. Is there is there some possibility that we could encourage the railroad companies simply to remove the lines that are currently there entirely so that there's not this notion that somebody might be coming across a, a crossing station when there's nothing there to worry about? Do railroad companies routinely remove their lines? They, they don't. Routinely remove yeah, routinely it. Routinely is probably a bad word ever to use with well, railroads. <laughs> abandon, yeah. And I'll tell you why. If you abandon a rail line, pick up the rails, and decide sometime in the future you want to put them back in again, that's a full blown environmental review. Mm -hmm. And anybody that lives in that area will say, no way, Jose. They won't, they won't allow it. So it's better to keep them in because I've already worked on two studies looking at the Dumbarton Quarter for moving people between Union City and Redwood City. And it's, it's important to have, that's a, that's a value, that's owned by the, the, the San Mateo County. And it's a valuable asset to have to be able to move people. I, I know you probably have gone over State Route 84 and, and enjoyed the bumper to bumper traffic. And one of the benefits of having that corridor is you can freely move people across the South Bay and so, you know, my recommendation would be to keep those rails in because I, I predict that someday they will be used for a transit quarter. And in reviewing your report, it looks like we're, we're going to be submitting an application, and maybe this is for city staff, we're submitting an application maybe next year for some federal dollars that might help in this effort. Um, assuming that we get those federal dollars, I would imagine that we're probably a couple years away from actually, assuming we get those dollars, implementing these quiet zone improvements. Would, would that be a fair assessment? Yes. May I chime in on that one, Tom? Sure. There is a notice of funding opportunity that dropped last week with a uh, date on it, which means the applications are due by October 4th, which could we provide the city with funds to do this entire project. Um, it would be rather a race of paperwork in, but you're in a position that most of your crossings are already most of the way to what they need to be for a quiet zone. And there are a number of criteria which you meet besides that. Um, if I may, I'd like to go to share screen and um, explain that program a little bit more thoroughly. Just a second. One moment, oh, please. Only a moment. It to my screen. Okay. Uh, Mike, I'll run the slides off my my. Uh, my okay. And just give me my, go to the next one. Okay, certainly. Okay, I think I see it up on your screen in the distance from me. Now I see it in front of me. Okay, there you go. Okay, it's a competitive grant program. It, it has roughly five and a half, $575 million behind it this year. That number alone is rather interesting because past years, the entire federal budget for grade crossing improvement grants has hung in the 250 million range on a, depart, on a highway administration program. This year, between this program under the FRA, the Highway Administration Program, and a second FRA program called CRISI, we've got about a billion dollars to use. Um, so there is quite a bit of money out there, and the FRA wants to spend it. Now, the type of projects that are eligible are, great, are primarily grade separation or closure, but it's not limited to that, despite the short title of the program being Great Crossing Elimination. It can be used, as you can see on the list of things there, for almost anything that improves the, crossing, the crossings in your area. In this case, you have three corridors, you have a crossing that is already being eliminated, and while that crossing elimination would not come out of this budget, that was used for calculating the coast subdivision uh, risk index, assuming that it goes forward with the removal. Um, you would have to have cooperation with the railroad, of course, and the federal share would not 
exceed 80%. So there's a 20% local match. Um, if you could go on to the next slide, please. Okay, there's a, the cap here is 20% of that half a billion dollars can, you know, is a max for any one state. There are some set asides which don't apply here, and they're including safety education. And at least 3% of the funding has to go for a planning grant. Now, the planning grants do not require the 20% match. So it'd be feasible for the city to apply for a planning grant right now to write the larger bricks and mortar program for doing all doing the entire project. It would also, I believe, be feasible, even with the deadline, to write a grant for the entire project, rolling the planning costs into that. Um, next slide. Okay. These, these are the evaluation criteria. Um, first of all, will it improve safety? Well, the numbers which are based on the FRA's own algorithms say yes, it definitely will. There will be at least one crossing closed, and that's Central Avenue. Um, closing Central Avenue will improve, or actually putting Central Avenue over top of the track will improve local mobility because you won't get the bottlenecks there that I witnessed a couple of when I was visiting a few months ago. Um, we have the normal things of reducing emissions and so forth. But now the next one caught my attention because you have the, what used to be your city primary fire station is tucked right up next to the track. And it's pro, it has the capability right now of being blocked in. So were the entire project to go forward, including the overpass, and a little bit of provision in the way of roadway work for fire, fire, easier fire department access over to Central Avenue, that delay would be eliminated. I'm making a guess right now, but if there's a freight train on the coast subdivision, I can see a delay for that engine of in excess of five minutes. My back of the envelope as an old volunteer firefighter was that if they could move straight over to Central Avenue, that would knock at least that would knock the delay to down to two minutes if there was a train there. Um, if your house is on fire, that's a significant difference. Um, we, the, the benefits here are, are fairly clear. Economically, that you would not have the backups, you would not have truck, you would not have cars sitting at Central Avenue. Um, and you would have, of course, this would only improve the access, once again, with Central Avenue over top between the two sides of the city. So I think this is a very, I think this is a project that would be very high on their list. Um, the other considerations, um, planning, financial support from the rail carriers. Um, I don't know a rail carrier that isn't happy to have somebody else pay to make it less likely for them to hit a car at one of their crossings. Um, uh, any questions for me on this right now? Yeah, just uh, real quickly, um, the I'll use the coast subdivision quiet zone as an example. If we wanted, let's say there's not all six crossings that are significantly impacting our residents from a noise perspective, would we be allowed to maybe focus on one or two of those crossings which create the greatest amount of uh, discomfort for our residents and not all six, or is it entirely required that you include all crossings in that zone, for example? Well, you, you can't mix and match. They would have to be adjacent to each other. Um, but say you wanted to cut Jarvis out and the next one down, and only you only include the ones in the center of town, that would be feasible. Um, I'm not sure what the index number would that on that would be. It would actually might it would probably be about the same because the primary factor driving the index was the closure of Central Avenue. Um, there is an option you can take, which is more of an administrative one than a technical one which is to have them only quiet at night. 
And I think the difference there would be having your sleep disturbed versus nobody home being bothered in the daytime. Right, but as I read in your report, um, even if you went with the nighttime, you still are required to put in the same um, safety requirements or crossing requirements as you would if it was during the daytime. Did I understand that correctly? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Those are my questions. Okay. Other questions? Council Member Bucci. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I guess we've, we've referred to the risk index a lot, and I've seen several numbers. And Mr. Messer, I don't know if you want to jump back up here to talk about it, but um, I'm curious what it's based on. What's the top of the scale? What's the bottom of the scale? It's been referred to several times, and I have never heard of a railroad risk index, so I'm curious. Okay, Mike, could, could you come up, Mr. Messer, could you come up to the podium so people can hear you in the microphone? Thank you. Mike, do you want to address the risk index? Certainly. The risk index is a series of algorithms developed by the Federal Railroad Administration based on the collisions which have occurred over the entire length of time we've been keeping statistics on them. And it's based on a number of factors, including traffic levels on the highway, traffic levels on the railroad, the type of protection you have, meaning is it simply a cross bucket with or without a stop sign? Is it flashing lights? Is it lights and a gate? And the likelihood of a collision occurring with all these various factors. Um, what we discovered is basically the, the more stuff you put around the crossing, the less your likelihood of a collision. And so when we go from one gate on each side only blocking the traffic on that side of the road to two gates blocking the entire road that removes or at least significantly decreases the likelihood of a driver going around the gates and getting hit it to some degree reduces the likelihood of a pedestrian doing the same thing and therefore your risk likelihood goes down is there a ceiling on that? And, and part of the reason I ask is I noticed on, I believe it was Maori, and it's not up on the display now, but I think it jumped from 37 or 47 down to 3,000, and it just seems like, uh, there we go. Yeah, so from 36,000 to 5,400, I mean, it, it's a huge jump. So I'm just curious what why that, because that crossing specifically is kind of out of the way. So I was just wondering why that was uh, assessed at such a high number. Well. Maui has every train that goes through Newark goes across it. Whereas, say, some of the other crossings, the Coast Sub in particular, only have a few of them, and the Nile Sub only has a passenger train, so the train count is a good deal lower. Um, it also has one gate on each side at the moment, so the gates can be gone around. It's got a commercial entity down there, which may be somewhat overstated in terms of the traffic it develops as far as this out algorithm goes. Um, we also assumed, and I'll make sure I get this right, we did this based on current traffic. And we've put in the developer's plans, put in, pardon the expression, every bell and whistle he could find in order to get a quiet zone approved for that crossing. So you had quad gates, you had you had medians extending far enough back that they could, the gates could not be gone around. Um, you had some rearrangements in curbing and access to the side roads that prevented going around on the other side, which believe it or not does happen now and then. And so the, like, the likelihood of a strike went way down. And you couple that with the current lack of traffic and the fact that even if the development went in, the, tra the amount of traffic would not increase that markedly if it was only a 300 unit development. So that's actually a reasonable jump for what we have. Okay, very good. I was trying to get a feel on it. And then, you know, Mike, I'm, I'm glad you had brought up um, railroad buy-in and cooperation because I was kind of curious what happens if we approve this and let's say we do get a grant and we propose these, you know, all these improvements and then the railroad says no. What well, then? Well, if the railroad says no, you're not getting the grant. And part of the process in going after one of these grants is they require railroad buy-in is if the city decides to go forward on 
obtaining obtaining grant money. The first call is to the gentleman at Union Pacific who handles crossing matters. And the second call is to the, the person at the California DOT who handles crossing matters. And he said, tell them, we're, go, we're going forward on this and spending the money. Can we have your support? And typically the contribution by the railroads is not that much for the overall project. So oh, we more, know. They're more, than, <laughs> they're more than willing to pony up some money to make it safer. So it's just a matter of early lead in, working with them, bringing them in and getting them to, you know, approve the project. And I, I haven't run into a problem where they said no. I've never seen that. Okay. And then can I just assume that we would send them this study sure. along yes. with, you know, maybe yeah. a copy of the grant proposal or, yes. or whatnot? Yes. You, you want to bring them in early so you don't surprise them because they don't like surprises. But if you bring them in early and they say, oh, the city of Newark is doing this, okay, let's, uh, let's, Let's review it with all of our people, our engineers and, and whatnot, and make sure that we agree with what, what they're trying to do. And then you can get their buy-in because, or they'll say, well, we'd like you to tweak this, you know, or whatever. But, you know, it's, it's good to send them a copy of the study. Yes. Okay, very good. And then last question, Mike, I, I had saw on um, the considerations for the grant um, you had marked down local labor, so I'm wondering if a PLA around a project and an upgrade like this would improve our chances for a uh, uh, grant. I hate to ask this, would you enlighten me on the word PLA? A uh, public labor agreement. So it would be an agreement that all the work would be done, you know, by a local workforce. That would increase. Based on what I understand from the FRA and from the uh, AAR, that would increase the likelihood significantly. Okay, very good. Thank you, sir. Thank you both. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Okay, one. Yes. Could we go back to the Maori location? I just want to get this clarification in my mind, and maybe I misunderstood it. The current risk index is 36,301. <clears throat> that is, is based on the developer's improvements that will be made to that location if a development is built at that location. The 36,301 does not reflect the current risk index without the development there. Am I understanding that correctly? No, that's the current risk index. Without, that is the current without risk. Without any improvements. With, if, if the improvements that were proposed by the developer were constructed, it would reduce the quiet zone risk okay. index to 5,000. Thank you. Okay, any other questions up here? No, okay. Then uh, city clerk, is there anybody on Zoom? Yes, your honor. Okay. Namit, you're unmuted, you have five minutes. Thank you, city clerk uh, Harrington. Uh, I am very excited about this agenda I think today, and for that I shared a presentation with the city council. So if you can flip through as I speak, that would be helpful. Uh, so starting first, I know that today is not September 13, 2018. I thought just to help recall how we got to this agenda item here today, I'd do a brief flashback for our council members. So I've picked a few slides from the presentation I had made to the city on September 13, 2018 about the need to explore increasing safety of the train crossings in New York. It has taken four years to get here, but I appreciate the city staff has had their hands full with a lot going on over the last four years. That said, I am happy because first, we've completed the study, thanks to uh, RLBA. Second, a lot of the findings from the study match my findings in 2018. And even though I don't have the experience of the RLBA team, I was kind of right. Part three, staff has created a great plan to help us get to the next stage of this funding. So as you deliberate and you ask these questions, I wanted to kind of help set the stage of why this is important that we as Newark residents continue on this journey. If you go to slide two, you will recognize something that we are all familiar with. It is a common safety device, so much so that even today we have a catchy slogan to remind you that if you click it, or you get a ticket. 
The seatbelt was invented by Niels Bolin in 1959. And prior to this invention, cars did not have seatbelts. And since their launch in 1959, seatbelts have saved countless number of lives. So the story of seatbelts can be summarized by saying that by increasing safety, seatbelts have reduced the risk involved in driving. And we heard a lot about the risk index. Seatbelts have increased the value by helping automakers build better, faster cars. And third, they have improved quality of life of car drivers and passengers. So as you think about the study that we just heard, I want the city council to remember these three benefits. Now, if you go to the next third page, everybody is aware humans continue to evolve and we continue to launch more innovations across all industries and railroads are not immune to such improvements. So if you go to the benefit slide, I want to drop the parallel to the seatbelt story. By increasing safety of our railroad crossings in Newark, we can first and foremost reduce risk at the crossing. That risk reduction will in turn help us to allow to apply for quiet zones. And once the quiet zones have been approved and installed, trains can still sound horn if they sense danger at a crossing, but they do not have to do so as a standard practice. This simple but big change will help Newark residents enjoy their homes in peace and quiet and potentially help increase property values in Newark for homeowners. Finally, on the last page, I know if you look at the absolute number of signatures, 414 is not a huge percentage given Newark's population. But the main thing to keep in mind is that the most affected residents are those that live close to the train crossings. And the second part is we did not do any additional outreach after 2018. At that time, we only had 285 signatures. So since then, simply organically, the count has gone up by almost 50%. And part of this is a lot of people are working from home, and these train horns are probably affecting the quality of life during the day, not only during the night. So to summarize, I appreciate the progress that we are making on this. Uh, I commend the city staff and RLBA for doing the study, coming up with the strategy for submission in October. And I hope the city council will support bringing this to fruition over the next few years. With that, I give my time back, if any. Thank you, Mr. Saxena. Uh, at this time, I'll ask anybody in the audience like to speak on this item? Anybody? Okay, so this was an informational item. Uh, but while it was an informational item, I would like to uh, ask staff what, uh, what it would take to move this forward with the uh, uh, possible grant application that uh, I was just uh, brought up. Yes, Your Honor, members of the council. Uh, Mr. Emai, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think at this point, staff would recommend that the city continue engaging the consultants, RL Banks and Associates, to assist with the preparation of a competitive grant application. Uh, staff is considering uh, recommendation use of unallocated reserves uh, for the matching 20% grant, should that be, um, should those funds be awarded. Um, Mr. Imai, anything, anything else to add in that regard? No. Uh, as uh, Mr. Allen indicated, the, the notice of funding is currently out, uh, call for projects with a deadline of October 4th. Mm -hmm. So it's going to take a, a pretty uh, extensive effort to get our applications in before then, especially if we want to go for construction. Um, but as indicated in the staff report, one of the options would be to, uh, if we want to go for funding for design and planning first, you could do that. And then next fiscal year, go for construction, or you can lump it everything. Uh, together at once, but uh, if we can uh, get a competitive grant application in by by October fourth, the other option would be to uh, uh, send the grant and just fund it on our own, and that means we would be able to maybe get uh, maybe get the project going a little faster because uh, even if our, uh, applications are due on October fourth and they have to be reviewed, uh, grant funding would have to be awarded and allocated, so that will take time. Um, but uh, it could be possible where we would go off, uh, go ahead on our own uh, without the grant funding, but that's a decision that staff would have to evaluate based on funding, available funding. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, sooner is always better than later. Okay. Again, this was an informational item. Uh, next item, Mr. Benoon. Yes, good evening, Your Honor, members of the council. Uh, item F2 is a consideration of an ordinance amendment relating to council member compensation. Uh, Assistant City Manager Link Havorka will provide the staff report. Ms. Havorka. Thank you. Good evening, Your Honor, and members of the City Council. Tonight, the Council is asked to introduce ordinance amending Chapter 2. Of the Newark Municipal Code to increase the salaries of the mayor and the city council members. At the May 26th city council meeting, salary increase options were presented for the biennial review of mayor and council member salaries per Newark Municipal Code, which requires increases for mayor and council member salaries take into consideration the consumer price index, which was approximately 10% combined for years 2020, 2021, and 2022 and also any increases in compensation awarded to city staff since the last mayor and council member, which is 3%. Additionally, state law allows for a 5% increase each calendar year following the last mayor and council member salary increases. So since the last salary increases went into effect January 1, 2019, the council is eligible for a 15% salary increase effective January 1, 2023. After considering this information at the May 26th City Council meeting, by direction for staff to prepare an order by 3%. Subsequently, at the June 23rd City Council meeting, Council again discussed salary increases and directed staff to prepare an ordinance amendment to increase the mayor and council member salaries by 10%. So that is the action before you tonight. This concludes staff presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, before the council gets involved. Is there anybody in the audience who'd like to speak on this item? Anybody? Okay. Uh, Ms. Harrington, is anybody at home like to speak to Zoom? No, Your Honor. Okay. So city council comments? Anybody? I'll comment. Uh, council Member Bucci? Yeah, I actually voted no on this the last time around, and I'm going to do this. Um, I'll be blunt and honest, and I know some people aren't going to like this, but I still have issue with the fact that we are have moved forward putting 20 cameras around town and are saving the information on people for up to a year. I don't think it's right for the city to be doing such a thing, and I think that the PD here that night was willing to update that that policy and bring it back in two weeks, but the council wasn't. But at the very next meeting, we were willing to table an item uh, for a 3% raise in favor of a 10% raise. And I have a problem with that. And uh, in good conscience, I just can't support a 10% raise on that. And call it what you want, call the protest vote, call it whatever you'd like. I mean, my motion for a two week tabling was referred to and uh, compared to defunding the police. So. I'm sure uh, you guys have plenty to say about this, but for me, uh, it's going to be a no tonight. Okay. Other comments? Oh, and Vice Mayor Hannon. Yes, uh, Mayor, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion that we um, support staff's recommendation <clears throat> and just make a couple of brief comments. One, the, the cost to the city organization is extremely minimal in terms of what this is as, as an impact to our city budget. Uh, and as I articulated the last time we met, you know, if we're going to ask citizens to vote to devote a significant amount of their time away from their family and away from their work to sit on the city council and represent the greater community, we need to compensate them fairly. And this certainly does not bring them up to a position where they're going to be uh, at, at a level playing field. Uh, because when you sit on a city council, you're not just representing your community, but you're representing your greater community when you sit on a variety of other committees throughout the county. Uh, many of those we don't receive stipends for, um, but again, it's our obligation, it's our responsibility, and we welcome those opportunities to do so. We wouldn't be sitting here if we didn't want to do the work that we're doing representing our community. Um, nobody's going to get rich sitting on the city council based on the uh, salaries that we do receive. Many of us attend uh, functions throughout our city to which we pay for ourselves out of our own pocket. This is a small opportunity to kind of reimburse ourselves for those costs. But I'm sensitive to, to Mr. Bucci's comments and 
And so what I'm going to ask um, staff is um, I would like to donate the differential from the 3% that we agreed upon and the 10% that I'm voting on tonight to support. I know this doesn't go into effect until January, but I'd like to donate that differential uh, to either a charitable organization or to the Newark Betterment Corporation through a payroll deduction. If you could get back to me personally and let me know how I can do that, uh, I'll make a commitment to our community today that that differential will be donated to one of those organizations moving forward. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, and any other comments from council? I guess I have a second on that, but um, comment goes with that. I don't plan on running for re-election again, and so I would like somebody that is going to want to step up to do what I'm doing to think, okay, that thousand... Two hundred and sixty or forty dollars is going to help with gasoline, transportation to the meetings. It's just um, like you said, we're not going to get rich off of it, but it's an incentive for somebody else to want to run and sit up here and represent our community. So with that, I second. Okay, and. Mr. Bucci, did you want to make the same commitment that uh, the vice mayor did about uh, providing the funds to a nonprofit agency? I actually uh, think I donate probably eh, close to half of my stuff throughout the year to different uh, charitable causes in town. So I love that very much, but I think we would be better served and better serving our community if we did what we were supposed to do and had strong policy in place and didn't save their private information and collect the comings and goings of people for up to a year at a time who aren't accused of anything. And, you know, once again, it has been said that if you have, you know, if you're not doing anything wrong, you got nothing to worry about. But I think that that's been proven wrong time and time again, and this kind of antiquated thinking. And part of this council's job is to do strong policy and to not do it is, uh, is a disservice to our community. So if, if we got to give 7%, back to feel better about recording the comes and goings of innocent people, then yeah, let's do that. Okay, so <laughs> I guess I'm somewhat confused with the, because you're using two different and separate issues. I am, I am not gonna vote yes on the 10% raise. No, that's fine, I understand that. That's you. Okay, so if we're making you a separate right. issue, if you guys wanna vote yes on a 10% raise and then turn around and, and make a commitment to a 7%, then that's fine, but I'm not gonna vote yes, no matter where it's going. No, you, well, you you have included two separate issues and, and it, it is just confusing. Well, it's not, that. you're the one that well, turned and, and put like me on the spot, to sir, so. Hostage to the, to the, if we vote for your camera thing, uh, then, then you would vote for this increase. No, and that's, it's obvious it's, that. Uh, it's not that, it's, I find it uh, frustrating that we can't wait two weeks for our police who are willing to do it to come back with an updated policy, but we can wait two weeks to come back with a bigger raise. That's what I have an issue with. We can have the police come back with a policy anytime. As a matter of fact, I believe the policy is an administrative matter. It's not even for us to, uh, you know, to, to, re to require that. Uh, it's something that the police department and other, agent, other departments within the city do. That's yeah. true, and the current policy is about 12 years old. It was done by uh, the chief who isn't even here. Constitution is 246 years old. Well, that's, that's fine, but we still have to upgrade a policy when we're upgrading something like 20 cameras and we're letting people not exactly being up front that we're collecting all that information on people, and I have continued issues with that. So. Okay. If, if you want to vote on a 3% raise that was originally put forward, then I'm happy to support that because this has nothing to do with the other, the other thing. It's not a quid pro quo, but I still have issue waiting two weeks for okay. a high, bigger raise when we couldn't wait two weeks okay, for a so simple we, updated policy. So we have a motion in a second. Uh, would you please vote?
Okay, motion passes three ayes, uh, one no. Council Member Bucci voting no, and one, <laughs> one absent uh, Council Member Freitas. An ordinance He's not here, but mind what it says. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Newark amending chapter 9, City Council of the Newark Municipal Code to increase the salaries of City Council members and Mayor by 10%. Okay, thank you. So item G is City Council matters. And uh, I'd like to inform the public at this time that on Monday, July 18th, the filing period will open for local uh, elections for both city council and mayor. Uh, I'd like the council and the public to know at this time that I will not be a candidate for mayor in this election. I'll have more to say at a later date, but uh, know that I do truly appreciate the residents of Newark for giving me the opportunity to be their mayor for the last 11 years and to serve them on the city council for 42 years. It's been truly an honor and a pleasure to do that. Okay, and uh, we'll go to council member Coyazo. It's not going on. Your honor, you always leave me last. <laughs> <laughs> so last night I attended our ACLAC meeting, which is the Alameda County Library and um, just wanted to let you know a few of the programs that they're having, you know, their free summer lunches, and that's here in Newark, San Lorenzo, and Union City. At the present time, there's about 40 lunches that are being given to um, students that need it here at the Newark Library. And um, they have, at the San Lorenzo, no, the Turtley Awesome Reading Challenge at the Dublin Library. And it's an out, a summer program. It's the outdoor um, at the Castro Valley Library. They had their programs for the summer there. And I guess they had a big to-do at the San Lorenzo Library as they were uh, celebrating Pride Month. They had invited... Panta Dulce, which is a drag queen, to tell, read a story. And there's protest, protesters showed up, mm. the Proud Boys showed up, mm. TV, there was news coverage. I didn't see it, I must have been somewhere else, but um, big to do. And um, Supervisor D Dave Brown got a wind of it and said, for this year, starting this July, they're gonna be having Pride Month every month till next July, and supervisors paying for it. So it, the kickoff is this Wednesday, the July 27th, and Supervisor Dave Brown will be initiating the at 11 a.m. and they're going to have window paintings and uh, vision puzzles and painting, and then at 6 p.m. in the evening, there's going to be a pastor there to give a blessing and, and talk about all the programs and stuff. So wanted to let you know that. And then I don't want you to forget that we still have a summer concert for July 22nd, which is this uh, next Friday, and then August 5th. So we have Cisco Kid on July 22nd and the Servants on August 5th but the best one is on Sunday, July 24th. It's a mariachi festival from one to four. Please don't miss it, come out. It's free, enjoy. I expect to see everybody there having a good time. And don't forget, if you're gonna shop, shop Newark. Thank we need you. the tax dollars. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Council Member Bucci. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you know, I'll start just by saying, you know, we even though we have uh, a number of uh, disagreements over the years, uh, I would say 98% of the time this council is on board with uh, and, and on the same page and rowing the boat in the same direction. And uh, even though we don't always disagree, Mr. Mayor, I am certainly uh, disappointed to hear that you will not be running again. Um, I think that you're... Uh, stellar career and dedication and service to the city is well documented and that you currently hold a record that I don't think anybody could ever touch. 
Um, you know, I've said this a number of times. I've, I've especially coming in as an apprentice council member, uh, I, I've been able to lean on you for a number of things and have learned uh, historically about why decisions were made and what's gone on in the city. And uh, I don't think that your uh, love of this community uh, could ever be in question. And, you know, again, even though we tend to, you know, we occasionally will disagree, you know, I have the utmost respect for you and I appreciate uh, your great service to the city that we all love. And um, it's a well-deserved retirement, sir. So I, I hope that you have, you know, actually get to go and, and do some photos and do some traveling and enjoy the time that you have. So congratulations, that's, that's a pretty big deal. Um, and speaking of big deals, I did want to let everybody know about our City Manager David Benoon, and I brought up last time that he had started coaching the Newark Majors All-Star Team. Well, I am proud to report that he uh, ran through the Division 14 division and uh, undefeated against four Fremont teams and to take home a championship. So, congratulations to Mr. Benoon. All right, it was. It was very exciting, and uh, they will be, they were moving on to sectionals. So there's a big game in Castro Valley this Monday, and I will be out there supporting the team. And uh, Mr. Brown, I just want to say, you know, what a, no matter what happens, we couldn't be prouder on the job you've done with the team, and it's always good to beat four Fremont teams, being the only Newark team. So thank you for your efforts, and congratulations to all the boys. Great. And Vice Mayor Hannon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. I would uh, agree with my colleague, uh, Mr. Bucci. Um, beating Fremont is always such a pleasurable task, whether it was quickly incorporating before they had an opportunity to take, take us into uh, their city, whether it was New Park Mall. We just continue to beat them at every opportunity <laughs> and will continue to do so. So congratulations on that. Um, I want to congratulate my wife. She's been married with me now for 44 years. We celebrated our anniversary. and. Uh, Anyone that can live with an Irishman for 44 years, I think, as Kathy has told me, she's got a straight shot up into heaven, and uh, I certainly wouldn't be the one to stand in her way. Um, to Councilmember Coyazo's comments about the Proud Boys, you know, that's why Newark is a welcoming community. We don't look at who you are, where you come from, or what your status is in our community. You're a resident of our city. You will be treated fairly at all times. And we have no tolerance in Newark for racism and uh, hate in our community. So we're a welcoming community. We'll continue to be a welcoming community. And then finally, Mr. Mayor, uh, I think Councilmember Bucci mentioned it as well. You know, um, we will periodically have our disagreements, but at the end of the day, we all represent the citizens of Newark. And there's an expectation from our community that we come together and, and, and vote our conscience make decisions that we believe are in the best interest of our community. I will cer certainly never object to any colleague of mine voting no on an issue of principle because that's what they're expected to do. You don't go along to get along. You vote your conscience and you vote the way you believe the community would want you to vote. Uh, it may not always be on the winning side, but that's okay. You're standing for a principle and nobody can ever take that away from you. Mayor, thank you for your many years of service to our community. Uh, we will have an opportunity to celebrate, uh, certainly at a later date, uh, the list of, um, of, of your contributions to our community uh, are long and are storied. Um, you continue to serve the community in so many other capacities on a volunteer basis. People don't really realize what this man does day in and day out, not just here serving as our mayor, but what he does for all the other volunteer organizations that he provides um, uh, his great input. Um, your services will, 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 will not be missed because we will continue to call upon you to provide counsel based on your years of experience and your expertise. So uh, don't uh, delete us from your phones. Um, <laughs> otherwise, we'll have to come over and knock on your door. So, uh, Mayor, thank you for your service to our community. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, next item is uh, closed session, and there's no closed session this evening, so... We are adjourned.